breaking news, Nokashita has leaked the Canon R3, Canon's new flagship full-frame mirrorless camera. It's good news for Canon, but it might be bad news for Sony and Nikon and every other manufacturer out there. And actually, there's a little bit of a twist in it for Canon. I'm going to tell you the ins and outs of it, look at the little details of the photos to reveal secrets nobody else has seen, and I'm going to talk about two new leaked lenses. But first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace hosts my personal portfolio website as well as my wife's personal portfolio and like five or six other websites. Whenever I need a website for something, I go to squarespace.com slash Tony. That's right, I use my own code <laughs> and I set it up and I try it out for free. I make sure it works perfectly. And then after my trial, I use the coupon code Tony and get 10% off. Squarespace websites are just incredibly easy and professional and they allow you to set up a store to reserve times for clients. They give you detailed analytics and a mobile app and overall it's just great, but just try it out. It's completely free. Now for a brief history lesson. This is the Canon EOS 3. It was launched in 1998. And I still remember where I was when it was launched because I was a Canon shooter. I was shooting with the Canon Elan 2E film camera and they launched it. And one of my office mates at Genuity bought this EOS 3 and I was so jealous because it had an amazing seven frames per second. But most notably, it had 45 autofocus points, which was unheard of. And that was like too many to select with a thumbstick. So they built in this eye detect autofocus and it actually worked okay. And just basically wherever you looked, it would focus on that one of the autofocus points. It was so cool. The EOS 3 took the features from the lower end EOS 5, but added in a bunch of features from the top end professional grade EOS 1. It fell in between the consumer and professional Canon models, becoming what they called a prosumer model. In the film era, this is what Canon's EOS lineup looked like. We had the One, which was a professional body, and that continues on to today with the 1DX. But it has not continued into their mirrorless lineup. There is no R1 yet. And the consumer side, we had the Five, and that continues on to today through the 5D digital series into the R5 mirrorless camera. But there has been no 3. This is what the timeline looks like. The 1 was first launched in 1989, and it wasn't Canon's first camera, but it was their first 1. And Canon takes these numbers really seriously. 1 is the highest that they can achieve. That is their flagship. The 5 series started in 1992 and went through to 1998 and it was a high-end amateur body though a lot of professionals ended up using it for things like portraits and weddings. So in 1998 suddenly Canon discontinued the 5 and replaced it with the 3. They took a bunch of these 1 series features and made it more powerful and also increased the price. But by decreasing the number, Canon was indicating this is no longer just a consumer camera. This is somewhere between that. It's a little bit better, but you don't have to jump all the way to the more expensive and durable 1 series. Now, around 2005, they phased out the 3 and replaced it with the 5D series, which continues on to today. But there's been a noticeable absence in the numbering. The low-end full-frame camera has been the 6D and the R6 mirrorless camera. In the middle, we had the 5D and the R5, and then at the top, we only had the DSLR, the 1DX. So why did we jump from 6 to 5 all the way to 1? Why was there nothing in between? Canon's finally answering that with the R3. Nokashida's very detailed picture provides a lot of information if you enhance. And if you look in the upper right corner of that picture, you can see one of the buttons and it's taken directly from the 1DX series. We can see a little bit of the text here and it says drive slash AF. This is a professional grade control style for Canon. It's meant to be completely weather sealed as opposed to dials, which tend to let a little more moisture in. You could change the drive like five frames per second, 10 frames per second, 20 frames per second by holding this button down and moving one of your front or back dials. The autofocus would be changed by holding it down and switching the other one. For example, switching between single and continuous autofocus. And pros need to be able to change these settings pretty instantly. And I've found that sort of this combination of a button on the left hand and your fingers on the right hand allows you to change it quickly and reliably. Notice there is no mode dial like there is on an R6. That's because it's a professional grade body. 
If we look at the front of the camera, we can see they have taken the 1DX button lineup almost exactly. This is more buttons than you have on an R5. There are the four buttons along the left side, just like a 1DX. We also see this, which looks like a gasket more so than a button. So I wonder if you peel this forward, if it isn't just a PC sync cord for triggering old school style flashes. I'm just not sure. The leaked R3 picture shows a vertical grip which is the style used on the 1DX. It allows you to hold the camera vertically. It also provides the designers of the camera more space to build in things like heat sinks, which might prevent overheating. It also allows Canon to use a much larger battery than they have present in the R5 and R6 and 5D series. That's one of the differentiations here. The battery has more than twice the capacity. The number one problem we've experienced with the R5 in our real world shooting is the battery. The battery runs out all the time. And when the battery falls below 60%, suddenly your frames per second drop substantially. So if you're shooting sports or action or wildlife, you have to change batteries once it hits 60%. And you're lucky to get through like a half hour or an hour of shooting before you'd have to change the batteries to keep that frames per second up. So Canon is addressing that because this is a camera for serious professionals. I can see just a hint of a top screen there, and I would bet that the top screen would look a lot like the R5's top screen, but it would be bigger. Interesting, the texture on it is different than both the R5 and the 1DX. They seem to be switching to a dimpled rubber grip. And this is much more modern than the sort of imitation leather texture that they've been putting on there since forever. <laughs> so I actually like the more modern synthetic look, and so I'm glad to see it. Here are my guesses on the specs. None of the specs have leaked yet, but I kind of know what Canon likes to do, and I'm gonna guess that this is gonna be priced right at $6,500. That might seem too high, because their flagship 1DX Mark III is priced at $6,500, and this is not a one. However, Sony launched the Alpha One, their flagship, at $6,500, and I think this is directly targeting the Sony Alpha One. And I think if they were to price it below the Alpha One, it would be like Canon saying, we admit this isn't as good as the Alpha One, so we've decided to position it below that. These buyers are not shopping based on price. In fact, higher prices often mean higher quality, and so a lower price might convey lower quality. I think Canon's taking the Alpha One on head-on, and they will match the price exactly. I have been debating with myself whether this will be a high megapixel, 100 megapixel camera, or if it will use the R5's 50 megapixel sensor and simply offer a higher frames per second. And again, I'm leaning towards this taking on the Sony Alpha One. So I'm gonna guess the specs are going to be 50 megapixels and 30 frames per second. This is entirely feasible because for one, the Sony Alpha One does exactly that. Two, the Canon R5 shoots 8K video at 30 frames per second using its 50 megapixel sensor doing a full readout. So they would have to do a little bit of tweaking to get the top and bottom of the uh, still sensor frame to read out at 30 frames per second too, but it's definitely tangible, especially in a bigger, more powerful body. I'm confident it will have two CF Express Type B cards as opposed to the R5's CF Express Type B and SD card combination. And I think it will record AK 30 frames per second video with no limit. Because the body is so expensive, Canon is a little more willing to risk cannibalizing their cinema lineup. I also think they'll add in the heat dissipation because their real professional users would not want to have to struggle with those things. After all, this is following into the prosumer lineup, and one of the things professionals need is a camera that they can 100% rely on, never overheats, never runs out of battery, and that's not something the R5 is right now. This is not actually one. I don't think they're going to put a fixed screen on it, but then part of me thinks that they are just using the body that they plan to use for the R1, so I'm guessing it's going to have a flippy screen. Will it have the famous eye detect autofocus that the original 3 series was known for? After the 3 series, they completely dropped eye detect autofocus because honestly, it never worked that well. It was flaky and if you wore glasses or even contacts, it became even less reliable. It just was not dependable enough. There certainly have been a lot of advancements in technology since 1998 when the original 3 was launched. So I think we might see it. I think. If Canon's resurrecting the 3, 
they might also resurrect their famous eye-controlled AF. It's also the kind of thing that would get influencers, YouTubers, bloggers excited and give them something to talk about. So I can see the Canon marketing team really begging to inject this little bit of excitement into the camera. Here's my theory about how the R3 came about. Canon had planned to launch the R1 for the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. They launched the 1DX Mark III for the 2020 Olympics, which were delayed. But most of us, including me, thought they were going to be canceled. But now it looks like they were actually going to have those Olympics just in the summer of 2021. So when he took advantage of this and launched the Alpha 1, and it kind of left Canon looking empty-handed. After all, the 1DX is old-school DSLR technology, and their R5 is not designed to be a professional-grade sports camera. They're not ready to launch the R1 yet. They would not use the number one and all of its heritage unless it was 100% ready for their 1DX users to migrate to mirrorless. And I think they just decided that they're not there yet, but they did have the body designed. They had most of it worked out. And so I think they decided to take the guts of the R5 and put it into their planned R1 body, thus bringing back the 3 Series, the perfect compromise between the consumer grade R5 and the professional grade 1 Series. By the way, I know people are going to get offended when I say consumer grade R5. I'm not speaking about how people use it, but rather how Canon intends it and markets it. They really try to push you up market by reserving the term professional for only their highest end cameras. In other breaking news, Nokashida also leaked images of the new Canon 400mm f2.8 and 600mm f4. Four. These are long-range telephoto lenses. The 400mm f2.8 is perfect for field sports, like shooting the opposite end of a soccer field. A lot of motorsports are shot at 400mm. The 600mm f4 is even longer range. It's really perfect for wildlife photographers, but some sports use it too. Up until now, these have been DSLR lenses, and shooters with an R5, for example, like us, had to use the EF to RF adapter, and that's not a big deal. I was actually hoping that these two lenses would take advantage of Canon's new DO technologies and really shrink them smaller. But looking at these images, I'm kind of disappointed because maybe they're a little bit smaller, but they're not substantially smaller. As a wildlife photographer who's tired of dragging around my 600 f4, I would love for this to get smaller and lighter, but it seems like they failed. Nonetheless, I've been holding off on buying a Sony 600 f4, hoping to see what Canon was going to release. So I hope to be testing that soon, as well as the R3. Be sure to subscribe to see our full upcoming reviews. And thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace, who makes websites simple and easy. You can join the 21st century and get yourself online. Yourself, your business, your friends. Send them to squarespace.com Tony. It will be incredibly easy for anybody to set up a beautiful high-tech website that works on desktops and laptops and tablets and smartphones perfectly every time. Set up a store, get an order for a print or any other product and print the label through ShipStation with a single click. That's how I do. Book client appointments in a calendar. It's all incredibly easy. Try it out for free at squarespace.com Tony. And when you love it after your free trial, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. In the comments down below, I'd like to hear what you hope to see for the specs. We only really know what it looks like now. What do you think it will cost and would you consider buying it? How much is this going to hurt Nikon and their Z9 plans, which are still kind of foggy? And will it be enough to fight off the constantly improving technology that Sony keeps putting out there, including their Sony Alpha 1? Thanks and bye.